Good evening and welcome to Arbor tonight for tonight's uh, Bible study this week. We're in Psalms 11 and uh, we're going to start there and uh, we want to welcome you, uh, all the people who are here and all the people online and uh, we're looking forward to a great Bible study from uh, some words written by David. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and open it up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given to us how you have taken care of us and seen to all of our needs. And Lord, today as we uh, praise your name and lift it above the name above all names, Lord, we pray that you will lead us and guide us through this Bible study tonight. May you open our hearts and open our ears to your word. May I speak your word. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start out here. This is a, a psalm of David. And... Um, this kind of reflects the crisis that David's in. Um, what do you do during a crisis? If your faith is not as weak, then every crisis is a catastrophe. If your faith in God is strong, then every crisis is an opportunity for showing the glory of God and giving him the praise and turning your problems over to him. Because I feel that he has a much better handle on it, the creator of the universe, He's worked out mathematical problems. I mean, look at how complex our cells are. Look at our eyes. Look at how the earth is in the perfect position. If it was a little bit further out, we'd freeze. If it was a little bit further in, we'd bake. Everything is everything is done to precision. And your problems are no, no problem for God's precise precision on how he can fix it for you. So here, David here, he's, he was advised to flee. Um, he didn't particularly care for that because to a Christian, you know, that's kind of questioning your faith. Um, and uh, he was advised to flee because of the attack of the wicked who were trying to uh, kill him. And uh, his response in verses 4 through 7 is to declare that the Lord is greater than any dangers from men. So he totally puts his faith and his hands in the Lord. So let's start out here. Psalms 1. In the Lord I put my trust. How do you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? Who do you put your trust in? Do you put your trust in your friends? Do you put your trust in co-workers? Do you put your trust in your money? Do you put your trust in your job? What do you put your trust in? We should always trust above all the King of kings and the Lord of lords who will never fail you. He will never let you down. God is there for you. Um, you might think you're walking alone, but you're never walking alone because God is always there with you. And he goes through the valley of the shadow of death. He takes you through. That word through is a verb. And that means you will go from one end to the other. It's like when the disciples were in the boat going across and they were fearful that they were going to drown. After hearing Jesus tell them when they left, they were going to go to the other side. And they're like, Jesus is in the boat sleeping, and we're going to drown. Doesn't he understand the situation? So he woke up Jesus, and it's like, you, you guys have a little faith. I mean, really? Seriously? Didn't I say we were going to the other side? And he just spoke, and the waters calmed. And they were amazed at Jesus' ability to even calm the waters. And that's what he does for us. When we're in the boat shaking and sweating and wondering what's going on, who's going to save us? We turn to the Lord. The Lord will save you. The Lord will take care of you. The Lord will protect you. And my trust is in the Lord. David says, why should I flee to the mountains? I, I believe that God is going to deliver me. I trust in God. And David was clear on this. My trust is in the Lord. Who do you trust? And that's a question that we all need to answer. And now on... Uh, Verses 2 through 3. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they mightily shoot at the upright in heart. Now if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And, and, and look at here in 3, right? Foundations. The first principle of life. What are your foundations based on? If they are destroyed, if your foundation is destroyed, are you left without hope? Are you left without direction? Are you that boat that's going to be floating in the water? 
not knowing where to go? Are you that person who's going to be driving in that car endlessly lost, not having a purpose? Are you that person who's going to go through life and not know why you were here or what you were doing? Well, that's exactly what we need to ask ourselves. And, and look at our nation. What are the foundations of our nation? Um, you can look and see that our foundations that we were uh, based upon are being destroyed. You know, um, Madison, the found, one of the founding fathers, said, Our country was made for a holy and moral people. Without such, it will not survive. That's why we can't send democracy or freedom over to the Middle East. They are not a holy and moral people. And you can pretty much name that throughout the world. Um, one of the, uh, they, there was a uh, conference for missionaries. And one of them asked that America has been blessed beyond imagination. Why hasn't the rest of North and South America been blessed the way America has? The United States. And one of the missionaries from Chile said, when America was founded, the United States was founded, the pilgrims went to Plymouth Rock and dedicated it and gave honor and glory to the Lord and dedicated themselves and honored him. He said the rest of the Americas, people came out of greed, out of lust, to get money to basically uh, destroy and, and take and steal the riches of the country. A whole different purpose. And he said, because of that foundation that the pilgrims built, because of that belief in, belief in God, the foundation of the country was set. And God has blessed ever since. But we see today, just like as in Rome, we weren't, Rome wasn't conquered from without, it was conquered from within. And you can see every major civilization goes through a life cycle. And once the religion and the foundations are the basis of justice, and the belief in God are destroyed, that's the end of the country. Because people no longer have, have faith, they no longer believe in God, what do they believe in? Well, as with most communist countries that turn to communism, the state is your new God. The state provides all, the, all your needs. The state will take your freedoms from you and give them to you and tell you what to do and where to go. And so we need to be careful. As more people, the Bible tells us in the end times, that every nation will stand against Israel. And I always wondered why in the Bible it wasn't written, a great country across the water comes and saves Israel. Because we've always been a friend of Israel. But when you go to the book of Revelation, it says, in the end, every nation will stand against Israel. And that breaks my heart. We, we, we saw with the former president before, President Obama, just how close we were to disassociating ourselves with Israel. He made it very difficult to support Israel. As a matter of fact, he did pretty much everything he could not to support Israel. We sent people over there to upset their elections. We sent advisors over there to overturn their elections. And just that kind of stuff there just shows how immoral it can get. And don't think it can't happen here because I believe what the Bible says. Every nation will stand against Israel, and that breaks my heart, because that tells us where we are going as a nation, unless we turn around and have a revival. And of course, if you believe in the rapture, I, I believe we'll be gone before all this good stuff starts taking place. And it is only when God's people are gone, such as when Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah, where Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed, the angel said, we can't destroy it until you leave. I believe God's going to do the same thing with the Christians. We're going to be raptured before you start seeing all this stuff happening. I'm glad I'm not going to be here for that. So, when the law becomes corrupt and rotten, when, when the law equal justice is no longer equal justice, that shows the deterioration of the society, and soon it'll fall thereafter, shortly thereafter. Because the one thing people expect is justice. And uh, once, the, once the foundation is destroyed, there's no hope. What about your foundation? What is your foundation based on? What do you do in times of trouble? I automatically go to God. 
we were in an air show last weekend and uh, in El Centro. And, you know, we take money with this little device here. You know, we can tap the, tap the credit card on there. And about uh, midday, all of a sudden, a system designed for 10,000 people had about 20, 30,000 people. So it naturally got bogged down. And it was, it was going really slow to process a credit card. I mean, really slow. And I'm like, wow, what am I going to do? And then I thought, I know, I'll turn it over to God. And I just said a prayer. And, ding, it started working. Took the next card, put it in. It was working. I gave glory to God. I've got no other explanation. I don't need no other explanation. I put my faith in God, and God delivered. And God can do the same thing for you. But the only reason why I needed to do that was because my, my foundation is such that when I find myself going through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fare no evil. For his right and his staff comfort me. And he is there with me. He will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I tell you that story so I give God the glory. Because God will do the same thing to you. So let's go on and let's look at uh, 4 through 7. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord tries the righteous. But the wicked in him that loves violence, his souls hate. Upon the wicked shall rain snare, fire, brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be portioned to their cup. For the righteousness of God loves righteousness, and his countenance doeth both be upright. The eyes of faith see the Lord in heaven, and the vision of God's eternal reality lifts us above every threat. God is all over. He is ever-present. And a lot of people try and mix up Satan with God's powers. Satan cannot be everywhere at once. Satan can only be in one place. But God, because of his divine nature, is all over. And look what it says here, right? The vision of God's eternal reality lifts us above every, every earthly threat. Not just a few of them, but every earthly threat. God is there for us, right? It says there in verse 4, right? The Lord is in his temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of man. The Lord tests the righteous. And he tests you. Why does he test you? Well, I've always noticed that when I get tested, I grow closer to the Lord. It's kind of like a rose. You have to go through the little needles and everything before you get through the beautiful flower. You have to go through the storm before you get to a rainbow. And that's the same thing with us. Are you ready for a test? Are you ready when life gives you those tests? What do you do? Do you panic? Or do you turn to God and turn things over to Him? For God said, turn all your burdens over to me. My yoke is easy and my um, burden is light. He says it. Turn it over to me. Why are you holding on to it? I never could understand that. I mean, but, you know, I always tell people, hey, why pray when you can worry? It's so much simpler, right? And in verses 5 and 6 here, right, the Lord tests the righteous to determine the quality of their faith. How is your faith? Have you had a faith check lately? You gone in for a tune-up? Well, right here in verses 5 and 6, it says the Lord test the righteous to determine the quality of our faith, right? Such testing doesn't indicate displeasure, right? Um, but on the other hand, it's often an easy road of the wicked to test us to see God's fundamental hatred of their ways. There's certain things that God hates. There's certain things that, call God, that God calls an abomination. There's certain lines that you shouldn't cross. Because God's word is very clear. He is, there are things that he is displeased with. And we want to avoid those things. How do we know what they are? Well, we study, the, we study God's word. Right? I mean, what's the Bible stand for? Basic instructions before leaving earth. That's why we are told we are in this world, but we are not of this world. We're just passing through. At least I am. And I know where I'm going. Do you? And uh, in seven here, right? Great truths to remember. 
right? That seven talks about here, right? For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. Amen? That's a good thing to know. The righteous character of the Lord is the basis for our own righteousness. And we can depend on that. Uh, when you go to the book of Malachi or Malachi for us Italians, right? It talks, for I, the Lord God, do not change. I'm saying yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And because of that, we know that what God spoke in Genesis 1 is just as true as in Revelation. All the way through the Bible. Um, you won't find any contradictions in the Bible. Now, you might have two people explain the same event different ways, but that's just the way eyewitnesses are. I mean, I'm sure if I went around the table here and asked them what, what was the first sentence I started out with in this Bible study, you'd be surprised where we'd ended up. Are they wrong? No, well, not necessarily, but it's how, they, it's how they express it. It's how they interpret it. That doesn't mean that it contradicts each other. And the Bible is the same way. You know, it, it's amazing. I'll, I'll hear people say, well, the Bible's full of contradictions. Really? Name me one. I'm waiting. And they can't name a one. But yet they're so confident. They say, well, I don't believe the Bible because it's full of contradictions. Well, if it's full of contradictions, name me one. And they can't. And God's righteousness of his character is the basis for our own righteousness, right? To please God, we must be righteous because God is righteous. Do we have to be perfect? No. Because we're sinners. While we're still in these sinful body, you know, we, we're, it's like the apostle said, you know, evil man that I am, I keep trying to do good, but I keep doing evil. We're not going to be made perfect until we're in heaven with our Lord and Savior. And that's something to look forward to. Because in heaven, there's no fermentation. That means you can leave that avocado out and go and watch the football game and come back and that avocado is going to be as fresh as when you left it. You're not going to have to worry about it spoiling in a heartbeat. There's no fermentation in heaven. And I can't wait to get there and try God's avocados with some guacamole and all the other little things added to it. That makes it special, right? So, as we come to an end of 11, this is how David challenged himself to the ones who were going to attack him, to the ones who uh, told him to run away. He said, no, I'm not going to run away. I trust in God. And God was there to deliver for him. And God will deliver in the same way for you. So let's move on to 12 here. David's prayer in, the, in this psalm consists of a complaint and a petition followed by a promise and then an observation that he makes. So let, let's read here, 12.1. Help, Lord, for the godly man cease, for the faithful fail from among the children of men. Right? That's his complaint, right? Uh, remember when Elijah had that little problem? Lord, every, every one of the prophets, everybody else has bowed their knee to Baal. And I'm, I'm the only one left. You ever feel like that? Have you ever feel that everybody else is bound to all of the other gods? The God of money, the God of leisure, the God of pleasure, the God of waste, the God of fill in the blank, right? And remember Elijah? Everybody has bowed their knees to Baal. I'm the only one left. Poor me, right? Are you the only one left? Do you feel like you're alone? Right? Well, here David says, Help, Lord, the faithful frail from among children of men. And he makes this observation here, right? Just like with uh, Elijah did, right? Everybody has failed. Everybody has gone by the wayside, right? So let's look at 12.2 here. They speak emptiness, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and a double heart do they speak. Sounds like he went to Hollywood. 
I mean, when you watch these people talk, right? <laughs> you just can't believe these guys. I mean, you know, their yes is their yes is no, and their no is yes. And the things that they stand for and the things that they support are all an abomination to the Lord. And he has said so, right? And here he's struggling with the feelings that all the godly people are gone. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel that you're surrounded by evil and wicked people, right? And the only ones who are left to speak are double-hearted and sinful people. Well, if, if that's your situation and you're the Lone Ranger out there, sounds like you need to get some new friends. Uh, probably the best place to start is by attending church. Here Wednesday nights we have Bible study. As a matter of fact, we have two Bible study classes going. And we have an Awad program for the kids. And certainly Sunday, you want to be amongst God's people to worship the Lord. So you won't feel like that island. So you'll have people who come beside you and pray with you and worship with you and serve the Lord together. And that's why the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. That's critical. That's very important. And that could be a key substance that's missing out of your life. I know sometimes when I'm wrong, it's always good to have a Christian friend who's going to lovingly bring you back and set you on course. I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, I was sitting at, the, at my office desk, and Mike was sitting right across from me, and I said some choice words going back on my old nature. And Mike lovingly and gently said, Hey, Vic, you accepted God, didn't you? I said, yeah, yeah, I accepted Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. He said, well, you know what? You don't need to use those words anymore. Because those words aren't from God. They take you away from God. Swearing, cussing, perverse language. If you're a child of God, you should have love, joy, peace, happiness. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. And contrary, what are not fruits of the Spirit is bitterness, anger, swearing, cursing, taking the Lord's name in vain. That will take you away from God. But thank God that I had a Christian friend who lovingly and gently brought me back to the Lord and had me going in the right direction. And that might be a key link that you're missing in your life. If you're out here on the island and you're all by yourself, and you can be a Christian and still be on the island all by yourself because of the situation and the place that you're in. Your work situation, or at home, or you find yourself somewhere where something's going on. But, but look what he does here. Um, when people speak with a, with, with a double heart, when people speak falsely, listen to what it says here in James 3. 8 through 12. James 3, 8 through 12. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil and fully of deadly poison. That's why the, the Bible tells us the tongue is like a double-edged sword. Um, one of my favorite questions when I, I like to ask people um, when they feel they're good, they they're good to come to the Lord. He said, have you ever killed anybody? Oh, no, I've never killed anybody. Really? Have you ever talked bad about somebody? Have you ever told lies about them? Have you ever spread gossip about them? Well, Jesus said we kill with our tongue. Not my rules. That's right from Jesus. We kill people with our tongue. Because you're destroying their character. You're destroying them as a person. And and that's what he's saying here, right? That's what the psalmist is saying here, right? All who are left speak from the double heart of the sinful. And right off the bat, they're identifying who they are, right? And and in Matthew 5.11 uh, and 18 through 19, Jesus said something that's worth considering at this point. He said in Matthew 15, 11, 18 through 19, it's not really that which goes into a man that defiles him, 
but that which comes out of a man that defiles him. For out of the mouth comes blasphemies and evil speaking. And then he said it out. He said it is out of an abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. God's, God's not really interested in what you do, but how you do it. And, and, and what comes out of the mouth comes directly from the heart. And that's where your true feelings, that's where your true motives are. It's from the heart. And, and, and when your heart is speaking like that, when, when you decide that you can blas blaspheme, when you can, you know, like when I hear people say, Ah, oh, Jesus. Whoa, hey, did you see him? What? Did you see him? Dude. Dude, you said it with such enthusiasm and the way you said it so strongly. I know he's got to be around here. And when he leaves, I want him to take him with me. People kind of look, they're a little startled and think I'm nuts. But why didn't they say, ah, oh, Buddha? Ah, oh, Krishna? Ah, oh, Mohammed? Why, why don't you ever hear people say those names? Because they're all dead. When you call upon the name of the Lord, you're calling upon the living God who created the universe. You're calling upon the God who created you. You're calling upon the God who defeated death and rose on the third day. Who is sitting on the throne in heaven and one day will come back and he will be judge over you. I tell people, you're going to meet God one way or the other. How are you going to meet him? Are you going to meet him as Lord and Savior? Or are you going to meet him as judge and executioner? Because the Bible says that we will give an account for every deed that we do and every word that we speak. And it said, in the end, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord before they're thrown into the great abyss, into eternal damnation. So are you going to be welcomed by the Lord, good job, good and faithful servant? Or are you going to find yourself on your knee Acknowledging Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior before you're thrown into the great abyss, into eternal damnation. I would hope it's the first one, because I can tell you that's a much better retirement plan. So, look at what he says here again, right? Out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So when, you know, it'd be a good time to examine ourselves. What kind of words are coming out of your mouth? Are they hateful or are they uplifting? Are they evil or are they loving? And that will give you a good indicator of where your heart is. And that tells what your motivation is. And that's what drives you. And that's what God is most interested in. What drives you, right? It doesn't really speak too good for our hearts, does it? And you really have to, you really have to think about this. The mouth is the voice piece of the heart. And if you find yourself cursing people, if you find yourself knocking people down, if you find yourself fighting evil, then you're on the wrong side of the ledger. You need to make it right and get on the other side, right? And here in uh, James 9 it says, James 3.9. In James 3.9, With the tongue we bless God, even the Father, so if your tongue is blessing God, right, and we know that your tongue takes what's in your heart, isn't that where you want to be? Don't you want to be giving praise and honor to the Lord? That's a great place, right? And it's the highest capacity that we have when we use our tongue to praise the Lord. That's the most glorious thing we can do, right? Right? Um, I talked with someone this morning who was pretty depressed. She was having a bad day, right? And I told her, well, pick up your little iPhone and put favorite Christian songs and sing to the Lord. I guarantee you cannot be upset, depressed, or mad and sing to the Lord at the same time. It's just an impossibility. And if you want to change your mood, if you want to change your expression, if you want to change your attitude, sing to the Lord. Works every time. Right? And when we're singing praises to the Lord, that's the highest capacity for our, for our tongue. 
because it's coming right from the heart, right? With our tongues, look at what John 3, 9 says. With our tongue, we bless God, even the Father, right? And uh, we're going to stop there, and uh, we will pick it up next week. We're in the middle of chapter 12. And, uh, yeah, it's a good study tonight. Amen? Had a good time. If you're looking for a church, uh, there's local churches there. I would really advise that uh, you joyfully go and worship the Lord. I don't go to church to be entertained. I don't go to church uh, looking at my watch every five minutes. I go to church to worship God. It's that one time where I get to get together with other Christians and praises, sing praises and worship His name. And I would advise to do the same thing. If you're in the Southern California area, we're in Lake Forest. We have Bible study at 9.15, and our service starts at 10.45. And uh, we also have Bible study on Wednesday nights. Um, this week, this Saturday, about 11, we have a, um, a food thing in which uh, Trader Joe's gives the excess food that they have, and uh, we pass it out. So if you need some food, come on down. That's around 11, depending upon what time the truck gets here. Friday night we have Kids Alive for the youth. They're practicing for their musical, which will be in May. And if you have uh, youngsters, uh, bring them down. They'll, they have a great time with it. Uh, let's, uh, I hope you enjoyed tonight's Bible study, and let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we, we truly are grateful that you have left us with your word that we can learn from the examples from ordinary men who have failures just like we do, who have successes like we do. I thank you for David, and I lift him up as being an example of how we should model ourselves. Uh, you, you gave us a path to follow, to honor you. Lord, we pray this week that you will bless us, that you will shine upon our face, that you will touch us and uh, just allow us to witness to others so that they can see the light that is in us that points to you. Lead us and guide us. Bless all who's here. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you.